and sustainability on the project, mm -hmm. uh, on, on, the, on the website of the company um, 18 years ago when we were two people in the basement. Right? So no. I just didn't do this because it was random. Right? No. I did this because I believed it. Yeah, these are not like pre planned to like any kind of routine full degree, so you know, I could ask if we had an agenda, but we just, we just keep going, you know. I don't know, some emperor dude put his daughter in this monastery to get rid of her, I think, but then it was kind of a big deal. So then they eventually gave the kind of control over Zurich to the uh, abbess of this monastery. Funny, I grew up in Canada and I wanted uh, my summer job for multiple years was planting trees. And you didn't kid, you finished you know, university and you drive or take a train. 12 hours north of the nowhere, and you would pay 10 cents a tree to put trees back in the ground after all the big logging companies had clear cut these huge areas. So yeah. That's like for three summers on 2,000 trees a day. And I always kind of joke that I've, I've, I've had my advance credit, but I think I probably long, you know, long past the, that 100,000 tree credit that I, I built up. Uh, yeah, so Bob Slynn, uh, currently work at Fun Plus, the VP Business Development. Uh, been in Switzerland for a year and a half or so. So the Taking the job meant I moved my entire family, so wife and mm. two kids. We live just outside of Zurich on a lake. If you were thinking of the most stereotypically Swiss existence, that's mm. pretty much it. Mm -hmm. You know, little village, lake, mountain in the background. Yep. And we have our headquarters here now in Switzerland. There's about 10 of us here. Mm -hmm. so there's about 2,000 people globally. Mm -hmm. And the bulk of the games teams are based in China. Mm -hmm. And all the big live games are in China. So what, yep. what I'm trying to do is really expand and I guess extend our relationships with a lot of the big global partners we mm -hmm. work with. So anyone from Apple, like Apple and Google obviously are top priority. You know, yeah. The core of our business is on mobile, Unity, even partnering with some VUA teams to make yeah. sure that we have visibility on new things happening on the ad tech. So the day-to-day -day relationships all live in China and continue to live in yeah, China, but yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how we can make sure we're more present and more mm -hmm. visible. Before that I was at Facebook where yeah. we met originally. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there for eight years yeah. in London. Did Always, always based in Europe, but essentially anything games in Europe, mm -hmm. my team and I worked on. So anything yeah. from originally Canvas to mobile games to instant games, trying to make the HTML5 yeah, yeah. work, um, and then a lot on creators, which we, which we certainly it's funny we we spent the last couple of years I was there a lot of time trying to figure out how we could build creator ecosystems, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then you know at Fun Plus we're certainly working with them on marketing. So what's what's going on in Switzerland? Yeah, it's a good question. It's funny. We uh, when I, when I moved, I mean, the only company I knew who was in Switzerland was MiniClip, mm -hmm. and they were really not really in Switzerland. They had a small yeah. presence here. Um, and you know, Fun Plus has a bigger presence, but it's a, not this similar structure. And mm -hmm. they were very much a global company, and there's yeah. a corporate headquarters here, but yeah. there's no one making games in Switzerland. Yeah, we've been looking around trying to basically figure out. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Exactly yeah. that question. Like, yeah. Who's making games? And mm -hmm. you know, it's obviously it's not a cheap place. It's not yeah. you know, and it's one of these things where, you know, Berlin or some of these other markets where you have that combination of create, creative talent, reasonably cheap mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. technology, and then a couple. You know, London has is expensive, but had a couple of Playfish and others yeah, yeah, where you had a bunch of people exited. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this doesn't really have any of those things that mm -hmm. create that mm -hmm. catalyst for a real gaming industry. That mm -hmm. said, it's interesting, like ETH, which is the big tech university, is yeah. very, very good. Yeah. So you have a lot of super smart engineers, a lot of indie gamers, or yeah, yeah. You know, two yeah. other guys in a basement making a game and they want to put it mm -hmm. on Steam. Most of it seems to be that. There, yeah. are, uh, there are a couple mobile game studios who are mm -hmm. trying to make stuff happen. And I think, again, if you look at Helsinki, it's, it has that, they all seem to have that characteristic where they had a company that yeah, yeah. created magic, you know, mm -hmm. Rovio initially, I guess, in yeah. Helsinki. And, you know, you know, the UK has a long history of console gaming before yeah, the yeah, Playfish yeah. and all that generation. Mm -hmm. So you have you know, all the guys in Brighton, all the guys yeah, yeah. near Birmingham and stuff. So I just don't think you really have that here. You have to acknowledge from a pragmatic standpoint that mm -hmm. with the changes on the market, marketing landscape, particularly mm -hmm. IDFA, what was a reasonably established ecosystem and, a, mm -hmm. and if, you know, again, if you could build a quality game and the metrics work, yeah. there, there was a reasonably clear formula of how to scale it. And I think that was equally true for a casual title mm -hmm. or a forex strategy or a social casino and I think yeah. you're probably getting a lot of these answers but my sense is that the games at either end of the spectrum i.e. the ones that tend to have smaller higher monetized player bases mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. strategy on our yeah, more yeah, male yeah. side and social casino on the more female side yeah. that's become 
extra hard just because of the cost of those players and the mm -hmm. lack of certainty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in some ways, there's a need to find other platforms where you have the ability to find new players. You know, I don't know, but my sense is hyper casual mm -hmm. is very seriously impaired, and so I think there's a strategic need to move. Yeah. Um, I hope that the space we're in and the space, you know, the that it's more a question of rethinking the platform mix and rethinking mm -hmm. the marketing mix, mm -hmm. that the games themselves I think, can still be compelling. Yeah. But look, yeah, it's uh, all, all, there's no longer any certain, <laughs> everyone's, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone's experimenting, everyone's trying to figure out where, where yeah. they go. You know, launching a new game from scratch is very, very difficult because, mm. again, I think there was a playbook. And again, if your game, the metrics were there, you could kind of, you know, you, you knew how to do marketing. Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of companies of our vintage mm. across all the genres have are now having to reset. And so you know, part of it is, okay, do I change the mix between Apple and Google? Do I change the mix between the different sources of traffic? But yeah. that ultimately only goes so far. So what mm -hmm. I think everyone is trying to do is rethink mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes kind of somewhat facetiously say it's, it's like everyone's having to learn marketing and learn yeah. kind of old school marketing because you have to think about, you know, what does brand marketing look like? What does yeah. TV marketing look like? How do you partner with creators and influencers? How do you do all these things that aren't necessarily purely 100% quantifiable? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned kind of communities, community building creators a bunch of times. Yeah. So how yeah. do you guys kind of plan to crack that? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think if you look at the kind of, I guess the circles of community or the concentric circles in a way, you know, we have the way our games work. It's all about the in-game community. Like mm -hmm. You're in your alliance or you're going yeah, yeah. to the clan, no. right? And that, that's critical for these games. You know, the mm. games, you, we lose a lot of people early on because it's, mm. you know, you're grinding, building your base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard work. But once you kind of get into that alliance, then that becomes this incredibly immersive community. Mm -hmm. So we, on our side, spend a lot of time building the tools for that community prospect, like all these you know, translation tools and all those sorts mm -hmm. of things. And then you have, I think, kind of the related, you know, the, everything from Discord to Facebook yeah. to Instagram to whatever else. Mm -hmm. I think you know we do a lot in those areas. Mm -hmm. I, I think for our type of games, it's hard to get them to truly scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have again, we have an engaged audience. We have a community yeah. team in Barcelona who yeah. have all the different language speakers. We, so we mm -hmm. do that. Um, I think the that again probably still serves that engaged player mm -hmm. base, though it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily grow the player base. And I think yeah. what you're getting at, and what I think is going to be, you know, we've again toyed with is this: how do you use community to grow your audience or mm -hmm. engage with new mm -hmm. audiences. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, when I was at Facebook, we spent a lot of time signing on creators who were doing, you know, live game streaming. Yeah. They would stream yeah. for hours of whatever game. And that's an incredibly powerful tool for, yeah. for building a community, both for the, you know, the game itself, for the creator, and then for the brands that want to associate mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. We have done marketing campaigns using creators. Yeah. But I'd say it's, again, like the simplest version. It's like, yeah. you know, here's a little clip or here's our brand. Please, you know, Basically, advertising. Yeah, 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 yeah. It works, and it you know because the people there are engaged audiences watching creators. Mm -hmm. But I still think, and again, it depends on the game. I think you have to have the right game, and our games still aren't necessarily the right thing. But mm -hmm. finding that beautiful space where you can have creators who are building communities, talking about and playing your games. Yeah. So it's yeah. part of where we go next. I think we're going to need. We're starting to think about how do we build deeper partnerships with creators yeah. as one of those key parts of the market. Yeah, we're going from this, you know, spreadsheet driven, you know, like you have full control, you have all the numbers, you can yeah. make changes yeah. and they are instant and whatever. And then you go to this world of creators and their communities where basically you're now a guest in someone else's community and you can't control everything. Mm. That's exactly like one of the examples that for our marketing teams, we're mm. having to completely rethink everything because again, it becomes much more about the narrative and the story yeah. and you're creating content. But again, you once that content's released in the wild, you mm. can no longer control the content. Yeah. And that intersection between your games community and the creators community mm -hmm. has to work. I do think this idea of building direct relations with your players, mm -hmm. which I think PC has always done well, yeah. Yeah. and mobile didn't have to do, is, is yeah. hugely important. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Apple and Google are enormous, and they are critical and strategic partners mm -hmm. of ours, and mm -hmm. the platforms, and that, that's where you know, that's where the bulk of the players are. That And the, mm -hmm. the ecosystems and the payments, there's, there's so much value there. But on the other hand, you know, I think as marketing changes and as our desire to move across platform changes, we need to build relationships with players.
I'm Blair Rowe, and I'm the CEO of Restore. The best way we can think about to describe it is that we're like Google Maps, but for nature. And so we are bringing together nature projects, restoration and conservation projects from all over the world into a single map. And that map is a place where projects can access data, the best available public scientific data, and then have a network, a connection to each other to learn and to improve. And by bringing this community together, we're working to accelerate nature restoration and really unlock the potential that it has for people and for planet. We, we spun out of a science lab, the Crowther Lab at ETH Zurich. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have close connections to the scientific community and a lot of our mission is about democratizing access to data that's already there. We have a range of different um, data sets and they range in terms of theme. They also range in terms of scale, in terms of resolution. And so there are data sets that go back to 1980 and have updates every year. Mm -hmm. There are data sets that go back to 2015, but they have much more detailed views, right? The resolution of the data is much higher. There's three categories of things that I think is always incredibly important to think about. Yeah. One is people. So yeah. what is a project doing for local communities on the ground? Is it run by local communities? Is it benefiting local communities? Is it wanted by local communities? So that's something that you should always take into account. Yeah. And then what is the biodiversity impact of this? Is this something that is creating a complex system? Are we bringing back nature in its entirety? Um, or we're bringing back you know, nature as something that interacts with a broader landscape, but that is diverse. And then three, what is the carbon sequestration potential? And, and in a way, that third one, it comes when we get the first two right. We yeah. will sequester carbon through nature when we have thriving systems that are complex and that take into account local communities so that people want to keep them. There's a lot of excitement around the potential for an easy fix to the climate crisis, right? Like, we're just gonna suck all of the carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, we have these incredible sh machines that can do it. Right now it's incredibly expensive. So the question remains, you know, mm -hmm. what are we actually able to do at scale affordably? For us, the mission is not find one perfect data set. It is how do we make it easier to access anywhere? And how do we make it easier to understand and interpret and actually put to use? We almost exclusively, and I'll, I'll tell you one exception, don't do the science ourselves. We simply mm -hmm. work with scientists all over the world and mm -hmm. take their data and we make it visible. And we focus on the product part of it and building the community who will use that data. Mm -hmm. When there are some key gaps that we see in what's publicly available, we might invest some resources there. And so we've been working, for example, on a model to actually count trees mm -hmm. and draw the boundaries of those trees from drone imagery. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to get a more detailed estimate of restoration progress. And it actually also allows you to start estimating diversity. So these scientific papers, the ones that we're choosing, have mm -hmm. an associated map. Mm -hmm. And that map gives a value for every single pixel on Earth. And again, those pixel sizes can vary. It can mm -hmm. be, you know, 15 by 15 meters, and it can be a kilometer by a kilometer or bigger. Mm -hmm. And for each pixel, they give a value. So if it's a carbon map that's mm -hmm. mapping above ground carbon, mm -hmm. and that basically is carbon that's in trees, it will give you a value, a carbon value for every single pixel. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do is we extract that map, we integrate it with Google Earth Engine, mm -hmm. and Google Earth Engine allows us, because we're integrated with Google Earth Engine, allows mm -hmm. us to give the user this very simple experience where they can go to anywhere on earth. You know, you can search for your hometown, you can look mm -hmm. at your backyard and draw a shape mm -hmm. around that area. And we are the cookie cutter. We just go, okay, mm -hmm. here's the data associated mm -hmm. with that particular place that you've drawn. I always like to remind people of these three big numbers. They help drive me and, and what it is that we do. 1.3 billion people. So that's the number of people whose food security we could improve by restoring forests, by bringing more trees into agricultural landscapes. That's one. 60%. Mm. 60% 60 
of species we could that are expected to disappear today, we could keep if we restore forests. And then 30%. And 30% is the amount of atmospheric carbon that has accumulated since the Industrial Revolution that we could pull down if we restored forests. So 1.3 billion people, lives improved, 60% of species that we could prevent from going extinct, and 30% of carbon. Um, that's huge if we unlock it, but we have to go fast and we have to go together and we have to do it responsibly. So we are arriving in Munich. This is the office. Uh, we also run uh, co-run a uh, video game culture club, and he's part of the the, the archive. Um, yeah. There's lots cool. of stuff we just got um, a couple of years ago when the Activision office was shut down. Here's one of our studios, Wolpertinger Games. Mm -hmm. Wolpertingers are the varying kind of mystical creatures. Talking about diversity, we have uh, Portuguese, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, uh, German, uh, yeah. Poland, all in this room. Right? So this is uh, another thing, right? We never considered ourselves a German or Bavarian or Munich company. Yeah. Um, we are an international company and we always have been. Hello. Hey. You want a coffee cool. or Fetic? I'm Hendrik, Hendrik Lesser. Uh, I do a lot of things, and one of my main things is running remote control productions as the CEO. Mm -hmm. But I also do a lot of politics. I'm the president of the EGBF, the European Game Developer Federation, which is kind of a meta association in Europe where 20 national trade organizations are basically uh, organizing it through EGDF to lobby in Brussels. As a company, um, one of the biggest games we did was Angry Birds Epic, that's quite a while ago with Rovio, where we had 120 million people downloading it, a lot of them playing it, so they, they kind of loved it. Um, it's, I think it's eight, nine years old, but uh, like last year there was a, from a kind of medium-sized influencer kind of reminiscent video about it, loved it. So I think that was probably one of the best games uh, we made from the family, and I was personally executive producer on it. Another one which is quite successful, is more in recent times, is the Bus Simulator from Still Alive Studios which is a completely different game. It's very chill. You drive a bus, it's multiplayer, unreal uh, PC console. Um, so these are probably the two biggest ones. But we made nearly 400 different projects um, since oh, wow. we started with RCP. Uh, to a certain degree, define success and, and all this, right? You know, For example, those ones where we actually help people because it's a, a serious game, mm -hmm. maybe not reaching a lot of people, but the people we reach, uh, they can be significantly, you know, uh, be touched by it. Yeah. And, and that's what I always thought and believed in, that games are so much more than just, you know, some funny entertainment for kids, right? Yeah. Or something you do in your summer holiday um, in the arcades or something, right? You, know, you can basically express yourself artistically, politically, um, help people to understand uh, complex uh, topics better and so on. To me, everything needs to have some meaning and is well thought through. Mm -hmm. And um, how we do it is that we invest into the game development studios uh, as what's called search for equity. So we're not really paying much money because we mm -hmm. want to be a real partner and mm -hmm. not an investor. And mm -hmm. we always go in with a minority share because I don't want to dominate the other party. I want to mm -hmm. be their partner. Right? And mm -hmm. ultimately, the people are working day in day in the studio, they should make the decisions. And this has been working quite well. You know, we founded the company in 2005. Now we are nearly 500 people all over in the family, lots of different companies from different countries, different backgrounds, doing different things. So for us, you know, diversity has always been natural to us, right? You know, this is, uh, and this acknowledgement that everybody has to, a different kind of motivation why they do this. So um, Munich, uh, where I was born, right? So I'm, I'm really glad that I could be part of uh, basically the, the developing uh, scene here. Um, it's getting more and more interesting, right? You know, we have mm -hmm. studios like Mimi, Mi, who basically are kind of now famous and um, did a couple of uh, real-time tactic games uh, over the last years. Um, we have a couple of uh, still publishing um, houses here in, in Munich, uh, you know, Microsoft and so on um, is here with a German subsidiary. 
Uh, we also have other development studios doing all kinds of stuff from serious games to working a lot. Um, you know, Bavaria is known for their connections to old industry uh, and all this. So there's a couple of studios doing explicitly that. Working with automotive, obviously, you know, mm. BMW is around the corner, Audi is around the corner. Take Berlin, right? It's it's quite mm. bigger in regards to headcount or mm. Hamburg. Mm. Uh, with some of the the much bigger companies where they they have three, four, five hundred people yeah. um, in that company. But um, I'm quite happy about Bavaria. What would you say are right now the current obstacles, but also opportunities? Of course, we have a geopolitical situation, right? We have war in Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, out of this, uh, we have. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of problems, inflation, energy, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, we had COVID, so a lot of the supply chains are disrupted and all this. Um, so, yeah, we're not in easy times. For, for many times we thought, you know, games will always win yeah, in a situation of crisis. This time I don't think we will win like we thought we could, maybe. Mm -hmm. But if you compare the numbers, right, and uh, if you take numbers from last year, um, there was a dip of one to two percent, but during COVID we grew twenty twenty five percent, right? So it's yeah. like if we now lose one or two percent, that's not really crazy much of a big deal. Um, yeah. So in my opinion, it really matters what we are able to do in the next three years. How does mm -hmm. that look like? And and there I'm as always quite bullish with, in regards to the games industry. Mm -hmm. As I said before, it's kind of the dominant culture technique of the century. So. That part doesn't really worry me. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What it means in practical terms is that on the one hand side, you know, free-to-play mobile is basically to a degree much more um, difficult to, to enter, basically for everybody. Even if you have mm -hmm. crazy shit tons of money, yeah. and it's quite difficult because of mm -hmm. the changes, especially uh, done by, by Google and Apple and, and all this, the environment has become much more competitive and expensive. And for smaller and medium-sized developers at the moment, it's a bit more tough because, again, geopolitical situation, all the interest rates are different, blah, blah, blah. Money is not that cheap anymore. Right? Yeah. Um, so if you kind of into this, um, then you have an understanding that it affects everybody, right? You know, the banks will loan you less money, publishers have smaller credit lines, blah, blah, blah. VCs, uh, how they fund it, private equity, you know. The yeah. interest rates, pew, you know, so, so kind of leverage buyouts and so on, it's much more difficult. So yeah. all of that means that access to money, especially if you're young and wild and <laughs> you don't have credits yet, um, it's more tough than just yeah. a couple of years ago. And um, what are your thoughts on the um, like platform monopoly, let's say? If you talk about you know the, the thirty percent, you know, thank it for Epic to a certain degree that they you know going against that, and I'm actually. You know, in favor of this, I think, yeah. you know, um, at least challenging it is, is a good thing. Um, to me personally, um, it's not just about the 30% or, you know, maybe uh, uh, dominance in the market. Uh, it's also about freedom of speech, right? You yeah. know, this is um, certain app games you want to do, Apple will not allow. Um, Google is a little bit more uh, less affair on that. But that to me is even um, as important as, you know, how much uh, of your revenue is actually going to your bank account. Yeah. Um, and access to data and all of this, right? So um, to a certain degree with some changes um, two years ago, uh, it's much more difficult for a developer to really understand where their, their players are coming from. Yeah. And I think that's an issue and I think it needs to change again. Um, yeah. So ultimately it's about uh, finding a fair way to work with each other. And that could that doesn't mean that you know we're not paying anything to Google and, and Apple because ultimately they provide that service, they, yeah. they build uh, the hardware and all that. So, But maybe it's not 30% of the future. I grew up in a family which was a very early uh, Green Party of Germany supporters, right? So I grew up with all that, right? And yeah. I still have to admit that I even have some tics, right? Where, uh, you know, already pains me when someone throws this away or, you know, mm. I can't see paper handkerchiefs or something like this, right? Yeah. You know, some of the stuff might be a little bit uh, exaggerated, but this is how I grew up. We can basically deal with a topic in games, right? And mm -hmm. there's been many examples, right? Uh, mostly, of course, in strategy games, um, where you have uh, Think Sim City, right? You know, this is uh, in the very old version already. Then at one point, you know, Godzilla, you know, some people don't know this, but Godzilla is also kind of the fighting back from, you know, the planet and all this. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Japanese culture and, and where this is coming from, mm -hmm. this is a reaction from Earth fighting back, right? It's mm -hmm. not just, uh, just a monster or something. Yeah. Right? And um, especially also in the series games field, you know, um, some of the early series games already have been kind of tackling that 
Um, and there it's not only about awareness, but it's also about, you know, having uh, big organizations, uh, especially um, international ones, uh, basically acknowledge that you exist, having the conversation. Also for them, understanding that to a certain degree they can use us to amplify the message again. Um, besides, you know, we run businesses, we employ people, right? So it's not, uh, we can also tell our employees uh, what we can do. Uh, you know, we have, uh, for example, the RCP, we have, we have uh, what we call the, the Green Initiative, uh, where we think about where can we save power? How can we get rid of this? And ultimately, I know that some of the people say the little things doesn't matter, right? But we mm. have to tackle the big ones. But to me, that is only partly true because with the little things, I affect already people around me and they have to think about it. They, they can't just ignore the subject, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is also having a long-term impact. Many people always keep saying that, you know, the, we have to come up with initiatives where it's also good for the business. Hmm. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm not one of these people. I, I get the point, um, hmm. Hmm. and uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining if it's also beneficial. For example, in employer branding, yeah. um, that people see on my website, hey, those guys care, take care of it, or, hmm. Hmm. you know, at least try to take care of it. Um, hmm. Let's work there. Um, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, I think there is a, a big portion of companies who, you know, if you can show them. You do this, then more people play your game, la la la. That brings you more revenue. Is, is one avenue. The other is, as I mentioned, or the the whole, the whole awareness. Right, so yeah. more people uh, like you guys doing it. Me, you mm. know, um, as ambassador of Game Stories Club, trying to mm. talk to other people. Yeah. Um, I think that's relevant. That more people stand up and say, "Hey, I actually do care." So would you say um, for a new studio uh, it would make sense to start off in Berlin because uh, in, in, sorry, in Munich? <laughs> That's what so they always say. Yeah. So I shaved it all up, shaved all my hair off when I was 18. And that's when I realized that my head is like absolutely gigantic. Like it, it doesn't, I, I don't think it looks that way normally, but if I don't have any hair, it's just like, fuck, you know, it's like bending light, you know, a little bit. So, so since then I figured that there's something, yeah. something going on. I just saw from my vision. Yeah, I mean, you're on me, the footballer, the aerodynamic head. <laughs> it looks small, but at the back there's a lot happening. So it's like, like a little... Like an alien thing. Yeah. Like, it's, I think it's aerodynamic <laughs> on the bike, but it, you always have to keep a little bit, a little bit of the mold. Nice. I don't know, sometimes I have these weird curls, um, yeah. and today is this. Yeah, me too, right? This. <laughs> <laughs> it's a common problem. <laughs>